So hello everyone. Hello everyone. My name is uh, Sebastian. I'm a proud member of the Shoel gang. Uh, <laughs> I had the pleasure of working with Shoel and uh, another colleague of us, Lionel, uh, during the last year on a project called Cell MPI. It's a library for the cell broadband engine. Um, who here knows or knows something about the, the cell processor? Okay. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> so, I don't have to say too much. Maybe I, I give just a very brief introduction about what the cell is. It's a processor designed by um, IBM, uh, Toshiba, Sony, and Mercury computers. Um, it's primarily, primarily, primarily used in the PlayStation 3, um, which is, by the way, six years old now. It was uh, yesterday announced, uh, uh, see, yesterday, six years before it was announced. So it's a rather old architecture. Um, um, it's also used uh, now in uh, TVs, in 3D TVs. Uh, you can find it, in, of course, in supercomputers. The Roadrunner supercomputer was long time, uh, was for a while the uh, top one supercomputer and it used the cell processor. You can also find it in um, embedded systems where you need a lot of floating point computation. Um, but during, the, during our project, um, IBM cancelled the uh, version 2 of the cell processor. They said, okay, sorry, we, we will not build that processor. So we were kind of <coughs> sad about that. But we were already uh, committed to the project, so we uh, completed it. And also, we kind of suspect that IBM might at some point um, bring a processor to the market that somehow looks similar to the, to the cell processor. So, at, and, and at this point in time, we will say, okay, hey, we have a library for that already. So, um, it, makes, uh, it, it makes sense to have this library. Um, yet still, I would like to justify why we should talk about the library for the cell processor in the year 2011, since this architecture is um, five or six years old. Um, we can look at the cell processor as a model or as an example for a heterogeneous um, architecture. They are not uncommon and they are powerful and thus worth studying. And we would like to present uh, some concepts that um, apply to all of those, to, to, that apply to this group of uh, computer architectures. Um, we will illustrate the lessons we learned while um, using boost libraries on this architecture, and we will also elaborate our choices uh, that we had to make um, because we not only use Boost, but we thrive to create a Boost like library for this architecture. So let's dive into um, the cell broadband engine. Here's a, here's a quick, here's a simple schematic. Um, the cell broadband engine uh, consists of one PPU or power. Uh, processing uh, unit or element. I will during this talk. I will say PPU or PPE or an SPU and SPE uh, interchangeably. It's just unit or element. So it has um, it has one uh, power processing core um, and eight um, stream processing cores. You can see them here. Um, each of the stream processing cores has memory, uh, dedicated memory. Um, which is unfortunately rather small. It's only 256 kilobytes of memory for both memory and uh, for both code and data. So this is a very big restriction of this architecture. Um, there's PPU memory, which could be called also global memory. It's just the, the main system memory. Gigabytes of, of memory you can add there. Um, you have an I/O interface to um, well I/O, and you have an uplink uh, interface to connect another um, of these engines, of these uh, cell processor engines to this one. Um, all elements you see here are connected through a very fast uh, ring bus, the element interconnect bus. Um, so fr from, from, from this description you can already guess that what you have to do here is, uh, since the SPUs are the, the elements that do all the computation, they are um, optimized for vector processing. You have to do a lot of communication because this memory is very small. So you, 
you might have to access um, main memory and fetch the data from main memory, put it in there, and process it in the in each SPU. That's the uh, basic programming model. Now I said that this architecture is uh, an example for a heterogeneous uh, computer system. Um, now you you might ask, okay, so what's another um, what's another example for these kind of uh, systems? Um, I'd like to think about multi-GPU systems as a similar uh, system. Um, if you take a uh, modern uh, system with eight GPUs and two uh, uh, pro two x uh, eighty six processors, um, you could draw the, the a diagram like this to to visualize this architecture. You have to the two CPUs, and since the modern systems are all NUMA NUMA architectures, you have kind of dedicated memory for each CPU, and also each GPU has um, separate memory, as you see here. They are not connected to, uh, via ring bus, but, well, you have to do a lot of communication to, um, to get your data where you do the computation. Have you guys looked at the AMD Fusion processor? No, we didn't. It's also a heterogeneous processor. Yes. It's a, the latest thing that can happen. Yeah. So this, this kind of architecture is really uh, interesting. Um, let's look at the features of the cell broadband engine. It's, as I said before, a power architecture core paired with eight streamlined vector coprocessors. And together, this, these uh, processes achieve uh, 204 gigaflops of single processing power, or if you, uh, if you want to do double, uh, if you want to do your computation in double, um, half. Um, the transfer bandwidth of this uh, interconnect bus is extremely high. It's 204 gigabytes per second. Um, and you have a very good performance per watt, which is important for embedded systems. If you, if you take some embedded systems, you wouldn't want to put a GPU in there that um, needs, I don't know how many uh, watts uh, of power. But instead, the, the cell is, even today, an, an, a good alternative. So it's, the cell broadband engine is a good fit for multimedia vector processing applications. And it's, of course, used in scientific computation. Now, uh, the bad things, or the things that make it difficult to write good or, if, or and efficient code um, for, for this, on this architecture. It's a distributed system. You have to do explicit communication, which, of course, makes it kind of difficult. The SPU memory is very limited. You have only 265 kilobytes. And you have no overflow detection. They removed all, all this. Uh, stuff in the in the hardware so if you allocate too much memory sorry yes um why was the the small memory for the uh spe was that a design choice by ibm yes or? yes it was a, it's a, it's a restriction um, to die it's, it's just a question of size because this uh, kind of memory is very fast it's mm -hmm. as fast as registers so they limited the size and it's also a question of power okay. i guess so um yeah. Uh, also, this memory has no overflow detection, so if you allocate too much memory, it will just wrap around and overwrite your code and you will get really strange errors. <laughs> um, then, the communication is also not straightforward. You have to think about the packet size you want to send. Uh, it has to be a multiple of 16 bytes. You have to, uh, the, the address, the source, and the destination addresses of the packets you transfer they have to be aligned to 16 bytes, uh, and you have to do explicit then, uh, direct memory access. If you want to optimize your code in the SPU for speed, you have to write SIMD code, which is often like writing assembly code, or even more complicated, since you have to think uh, more about, you know, because you have vectors. And there's also a pipelining mechanism. mechanism uh, so you, you have, it's, it has two pipelines. But uh, getting that just right is also rather complicated. With our library, with the Cell MPI library, we uh, try to simplify many of these uh, restrictions to make it easier for developers to write efficient code. So the DMA is to main memory? Or, or the 
on, on chip memory. Um, direct memory access. You can do direct memory access from anywhere to anywhere. Uh -huh. So you can, from the from the SPU, you can say, I want to load from global, global memory or use store to global memory. And from the PPU, you can also, so from the power uh, core, you can also access the memory on the SPU. Okay. So you can do whatever you want. And, and between SPU. And of course, between SPUs, mm -hmm. which is an important point in, in our library. Mm -hmm. So what, it, what does it take to write code for the cell processor? Um, PPU and SPU code have, diff have their separate main functions. You have two compilers, uh, PPU uh, GCC and SPU GCC. Um, after the SPU code is compiled, you pass it into another tool that generates a library that can be linked against the PPU uh, code. And this library exports a symbol that can be loaded from SPU code. So rather complicated. The PPU will create for each uh, SPU a thread, loads the symbol, and starts uh, uh, executing the data. Arguments are passed through uh, the argument vector, uh, just like the, the arg, arg v, arg c in, in the main function. And what you would do normally is you would um, pass a pointer to a structure in, main, in global memory, and in your structure you have your actual arguments, and then you use direct memory access to fetch your arguments into the SPU memory. So it's, again, kind of strange. The code to do this, uh, using the IBM provided uh, library, which is a C-style uh, library, it looks like this. You would uh, tell the mem memory flow controller um, to get some address from global memory, put it there, you give it a size, a tag, and then you, since all these operations are asynchronous, because it's DMA, you have to wait for this uh, communication, for this transfer to finish, and then you can use your, your data. How many DMA controllers are there? Each uh, element has one uh, DMA controller. Each element of the, each yeah. thing that is connected to the bus. Yeah. Yes. So, as you can see, the, to, to get extra only to get started to write code, it can be quite, quite tedious. Um, compilation and startup are not trivial. Um, we have two weapons to fight this uh, strangeness. First is CMake to simplify the convoluted build process. Um, we think it's a, it's really a great tool if you have if you if you develop for an architecture that has strange build mechanisms where you need to do really weird things, and just I would suggest just use CMake, you can simplify everything in a very uh, easy way. Um, first of course, it, it of course allows you to find all the libraries and binaries you need on the system, and then we wrote some low-level macros to activate just the PPU and the SPU compilers, and for the user of our library, we ship uh, macro, a CMake macro that allows you to just um, add, to, to just define code that, that you would that you wouldn't want to run on the SPU. Um, you say, okay, my code is in file 0 to whatever, file n, and you say, um, I want this code to export a symbol, and I want to link my, the library that is generated from these files to this, tar to this CMake target, and you're done, basically. So this, this includes all the, the weird, weird stuff where you have to call another compiler, call uh, to, to uh, create a library, and things like that. So as you can see, um, we not only use the CMake to, to help us while we develop uh, code for, for this uh, architecture, but we also ship parts of the stuff we use for, with CMake to allow our users to um, uh, benefit from this. And then, of course, we use C++ and Boost. Um, the recurring boilerplate code that you have to write to start SPU code and uh, pass your arguments can be, of course, wrapped in functions and classes. 
And really what you want in the end is <coughs> that you write your kernel that you want to run on the SPU just as a free function. You say, okay, this is my kernel. It takes these arguments. And then you, on the PPU, you just call it as a free function. This is really the goal you have. So um, using our library, the bootstrapping uh, process looks like this. We, you, cr we create a you create a structure where you put all your arguments inside, the arguments you want to pass to the SPU code, and then you define a kernel uh, using these uh, two macros. You say, okay, I have a here, I have a pointer to this structure, and please fill fill this pointer. I, no, I, or I want this pointer now to point to uh, this structure I created on, in PPU memory, but I want to have it, of course, in my uh, SPU code. And this, this kernel does nothing, it just returns, uh, just computes something and returns a value. In PPU code, you would re register the kernel, so this is the symbol that was uh, exported during com the compilation phase. Uh, then you initialize the runtime using a, a function, ppu init. Um, and then you can, can call the kernel asynchronously. You just create, this, uh, create an instance of this structure, fill it with some uh, values, and you run the, your kernel and pass the um, argument structure. This, is, this run is uh, uh, asynchronous. Um, but you can, of course, wait for, for this to complete using another function. And you can access the kernel's return values using a PPU return function. Uh, the runtime can be finalized using PPU finalize. Um, what happens inside is something like this. When you call, when PPU init is called, um, a thread and control blocks are allocated. Uh, PPU run uh, will actually start threads, uh, load the SPU program. Uh, on the SPU, then automatically the control block is loaded into, into memory, as well as the user data. Um, then there's a synchronization step, step where the SPU says, okay, now I'm, I'm ready to run. And the PPU that then says, okay, now please run, run your code. Here's the actual code. Um, then there's a, a function that returns a value to the PPU. And if you, at this point, uh, say, OK, I want to run the same kernel again, maybe with this different arguments, uh, you will just go through this loop or here through this loop and run your kernel code again. Or if you, of course, uh, finalize the environment, it's uh, the threads join, and you're done. Now, um, this uh, this way of starting stuff is still not pretty, not very nice. Especially, especially what we didn't like is having to do something like this. So we thought how we could even simplify simplify this even more, and we have now uh, what we call a boostified version, or fancy version of starting a kernel. What you do is, um, you, there's a macro called SPU function. You say, okay, I want to define an SPU function that is called kernel, and it takes these arguments. You might already guess what this is. Um, it's a boost preprocessor sequence. And here's uh, the symbol that is exported. And so this code is both included in the SPU code this line is both included in the SPU code and the PPU code. And for both, uh, comp both compilers will generate completely different code. But what this allows you to do is to write a free function that takes the arguments you, you might expect and just return a value. And on the, in, in PPU, you, in, on the PPU, you can just call this free function with your arguments. So all, all the stuff that we, sh we saw before is done internally by, uh, by this macro. <coughs> and you even, there's, even, there's another function generated uh, that's called with, with uh, underscore async appended to call the, the kernel function asynchronously. 
So this. So, so you are you are turning it into a, um, like a regular Reno procedure, RPC, right? Yeah. It looks yeah. like RPC. Yeah. Some, something like that. It it actually looks like oh, it actually looks like just calling a function. But what happens internally is that the function will be executed mm -hmm. on the SP on all SPUs, actually, on all eight SPUs. How does it return? Get the return type? Oh, very good question. There, <laughs> there's a limitation. That's one of the limitations. You can only have a 32 uh, bit return type. Right. No. Bit. One oh, an int. Oh yeah, an int. An int. So it's always an int. Okay. Yeah. If you wanted to return something bigger, you would uh, do a do this in the kernel with some communication stuff. So we do C++, but due to the limitations on the SPU, um, we limit some of the C++ features. Um, we don't uh, compile with runtime type information, which is just to uh, reduce the size. Um, we don't do any dynamic memory allocation in our library. This is to to have a predictable footprint for all the developers, so the developer will know, okay, the library is this size and it will not grow. This is very important so that the, the user can um, calculate how much memory he can all allocate to use for his, his own code. Of course, since we use uh, templates and, and stuff like that, depending on the, on the code of our use in, from our library, it will still grow. But we don't do dynamic allocation. So when you start um, your execution, the the memory the library needs will not will never grow. Um, if you want to use uh, STL um, containers, we give you some lightweight allocators that even that that implicitly fulfill the alignment uh, requirements that are uh, put on the on the user for the communication. Um, and we don't do exception handling on the SPU. So this, uh, these custom lightweight uh, allocators, they are interesting because we found that if we use the regular um, STL allocators, we will have up to 25 kilobytes of overhead. Even if we say uh, we want to use the um, allocators that don't throw exceptions. So we, we give our own allocators that just call uh, aligned malloc internally, and then do um, yeah. okay. So um, we deactivate exception handling, but exceptions are uh, important and interesting feature. So we kind of emulate that. Um, if you if there's an exception on the SPU, the SPU stops and notifies the PPU. Um, so the SPU will only throw an error code. It's, it's not really an exception. We call it throw to um, signal to the user, OK, there's, on the, on the PPU, you will get an exception. But on the SPU, there's just uh, an error code returned. And the PPU translates this error code into, um, into a, an exception. Um, we have an, an error bundle since we have eight SPUs, and it might be the case that all eight SPUs throw an exception. Um, and we just have an SPU runtime exception that inherits from um, boost exception. Yeah, and if you're familiar with, with boost accept exception, you know this. Um, it's, uh, we can even interrupt the PPU execution on, in the case of an SPU exception if you want this. It's, a, it's optional. Sometimes you, you want this, but most of the time I think you want to uh, control when you get some information from the SPU. And to define the errors, and to define uh, errors or exceptions, we use the same trick as we used for the bootstrapping stuff, where we have one line of code and compile it with two different compilers, and the, the code generated will be vastly different. So we have like a we have a macro that's called error and that allows us to define an error. Um, here's an error code. Here's an error symbol, 
and here's a, a string that describes the error. When we compile this on the SPU, something like this will be generated. So it doesn't have the string, essentially it doesn't have the string included because the string is of course overhead. And um, on the PPU, we'll generate uh, something like this that contains both the symbol, the message, and the ID. Okay, so we have exceptions. Uh, what else do we want? We want to test our code on the PPU and on the SPU. Um, we thought about using boost test, but the overhead is just too great to fit the memory, uh, the SPU memory. It's, uh, I, I checked, uh, it, the library is almost one megabytes on, uh, megabyte in my system. <coughs> the first idea is, of course, to use boost, uh, the, the lightweight test, um, but it, it just misses a lot of the, the cool stuff that is in boost test. So we created our own uh, very lightweight uh, SPU test, uh, a test uh, framework. It's called SPU unit. Um, it's a compromise between this and the, the full-blown unit testing framework. So it's defined, designed after boot test, boost test. We just looked at what boost test does and uh, stole a lot of the cool stuff. Um, so you, you only have one test suite, um, and tests are started explicitly. So in your main in your SPU kernel, you will do you will call something like run test suite, and you get a, re a return value the, that uh, tells you how many of the tests failed. So really, you want here to re you want the, this uh, to return zero, and then of course you can uh, return this value back to the PPU to give some output. Um, we really like the auto test case template uh, macro in boost test, so we ported it to the, the SPU and we successfully. And of course the normal uh, test case template uh, macros are also included. If you're not familiar with this, um, this uh, allows you to pass to a test case a type list and the, the framework will just generate for each type in the type list the test. And you can use T in your code and write one, one test case for, for many tests. Uh, yeah, for many types. We have warn, check, and require uh, test tools. Um, we can disable strings, again, to, to uh, save memory. So we can activate a silent mode where that only returns a, a value that gives you, that indicates how many tests failed. And since we emulate exceptions, we can even have the require throw or uh, require no throw macros in our code. Uh, here's an example of what the test case looks like in our unit test. Um, we create a, a vector that contains the uh, different alignments, MPL vector. Um, we create a test suite, and here we have the, the, this auto test case template macro. Here's the name of the test case, here's the type that we can use here, and this is the type list. And we can just, uh, what's happening here, uh, we, we allocate some memory uh, with an alignment, one of those, and we check if the, uh, what we allocate is actually aligned in the way we wanted it to be free, and we check if the pointer got freed, the memory got freed. And um, here we just start the unit test. So that's what it, that, that is what it, the unit test looks like. This is so, so far the boring stuff. Now we will, I want to show you the, the cool stuff we need. Now um, I said before that what you want to do uh, is always transfer the data you compute on to the SPUs and run your code and save the result back to uh, the main memory. Um, this could look like this. Um, I don't know if you can read that in the back, I hope. Um, so we iterate over some data in a for loop. We load the data using the function get the memory uh, into, into some buffer we allocated 
Um, then we run through <laughs> our algorithm. In this case, it's called it's a it's an Harris uh, SIME uh, SIME version of a Harris code, and then we put the result back. Um, this algorithm is some image processing algorithm, so it will have as input an image uh, or a part of an image, and um, will output an, the same part of an image filtered or processed in, in some way. So it's, it's straightforward. You get data, run an algorithm, put that data back. Um, yeah, here you see um, we load, we calculate, we store. Okay, now what what you really what you do here is something like this: you lo you load your first block, you compute, and you store. You load the second block, you compute, you store. Um, this is rather inefficient since we can do direct memory access, which allows us to overlap computation and communication. So what you really want to do is some sort of multi-buffering. Um, in the case of double buffering, it will look like this. Here we have the, the lead-in phase, where we, the, we load the first data. We, uh, this is the, the, the inefficient phase, where we cannot overlap computation and communication. Um, we load the first block, we compute. Before we start computing, we, we start loading the second block. So this will already overlap. And after we are, fini after we are finished computing the first, uh, after we finish computing this, we store it back, but at the same time, we can start the computation on this block since we already um, loaded it. It's the basic uh, principle of uh, double buffering. Um, and so on and so on and so on. Here you can see in these, in these two uh, areas, you can see that communication and computation is perfectly overlapped. Of course, if both take uh, the same time. And then there's a lead out phase where we stop loading data, uh, we just store the, the, the one we computed here, we do the last computation and then we have to store the last one. Normally of course this is a lot larger, this part, like, uh, so the, the lead in and the lead out uh, overhead is comparatively small. Now if you wanted to write something like this, um, for the cell using uh, using the simple C uh, uh, functions, you would get code like this, a, a big mess. <laughs> I don't want you to uh, understand, or well, it's easy to understand actually, I don't want you to, to read this all. Um, it, I just want to show you that it's, it's a lot of code for something straightforward. Um, so what you, What's happening here is you asynchronously load the first uh, stuff you want to compute on. Then you start your iteration, so this would be the lead-in. Uh, you load asynchronously depending on uh, if i is even or uneven, you load in the one buffer or the other. You have to synchronize uh, the correct DMA transfer. Of course, you, can, you should not, you have to synchronize the one uh, for the buffer you want to use right now. And then you start your calculation and you store uh, the data in the same way you did here. But of course here you don't need the synchronization. You synchronize here for both the input and the output buffer since you want to make sure that the input is there and the output was, output was stored back so you can overwrite the output buffer. Okay, so as I said, this is, this is a big mess. Uh, this code and um, I found that I had, while I was implementing some algorithms, I found that I had, had to write this code over and over again, even in more complicated ways if you want to have a buffer that is both output and input, it gets, it gets really weird. So I started to look at this um, and start, try to extract the, the, the operations that are done here. So the operations are we start loading the first uh, segment, we start loading the next segment, we want to wait for the uh, segment that we want to compute on, uh, we want to signal that, the com that we are finished computing with this segment, we, want to, we don't need it anymore. Um, so I look at, I look at this, these uh, 
uh, operations and thought, okay, well, really what's happening here is we're just iterating over some data. Uh, can't I write an iterator that does all this weird double buffering and dynamic memory access uh, for me? And as it turns out, you can't. So start loaning the first segment is just an, an operator equal. You just say our iterator is equal to something. And this way we know, okay, we want to load from this address and we can start loading the first segment. Start loading the next segment, of course, is operator plus plus. We say, okay, now I want to uh, proceed to the next element or to the next segment. To wait for the segment uh, to be ready for computation, we do uh, operator star. We say, okay, now I want to access the memory. I want to use it. And to signal that the computation is finished, we can again use plus plus. We, at first we thought, okay, damn, this uh, input, the, the iterator uh, concept, it doesn't fit. We, we have no way to say we are finished now. But in fact, you, you don't need something separate there. You can just say, okay, if I want to, if I want to proceed to the next, it's, it's obvious that I'm finished with the, with the last. So I don't need it anymore. Uh, there's, of course, one element missing. And that's the check if the data, if, if the end of the data is reached. So we have an operator equal equal here too. Now we, we had this idea and we implemented uh, a very simple prototype. It looked something like this. It's a remote segment input iterator and it has all the operations I just uh, explained. Uh, some constructor that actually allocates the buffers we need to do the communication. Um, the equal operator takes in our, in our prototype just an address uh, to say, okay, we want to load from starting from this address. Um, the star operator will do the DMA synchronization. The plus plus operator will start the next, uh, start loading the next data. And of course the equal equal stuff. So if we, if we used our, uh, these iterators, we wrote an input iterator, we wrote another output iterator, we used it uh, to, to uh, rewrite uh, this lengthy code, and lo and behold, it looks like this. Very simple. We create a remote segmented input iterator, we say we want to operate on floats, we, s we give a depth. The depth is the number of buffers we use. Like we do, if we do multiple double buffering, we say we want to use two buffers. We want to switch between two buffers. We can use three or seven if, if, if we think that's an advantage. We give the size of the slice that we want to operate on. Of course, we don't want to access single. We don't want to DMA access single elements of our vector because we want to access a block, a segment, like. 1024 or something like that. So this is the slice size. It's not a regular iterator, it's a segmented iterator. So it's a segment size of slice size or whatever. And then we uh, give a slicer, which is, which is a function object that, uh, takes, as, that takes one uh, argument. This is, of course, the constructor. If, if you, the, the um, bracket operator takes one argument, which is the number of iterations that we already did. And it will return um, the address of the memory we want to access. So it, it allows us to slice uh, our big vector in different ways. I will show an example of this in, on the next slide. But um, the loop now looks like this. We, here we assign our iterators to some address, input. We assign the output iterator to an, another address, output, and this is the lead-in. Here already, the iterators start getting the data, um, at least for the input iterator. Of course, the output iterator does nothing. You know. um, then we check if we reach the end. We, we just put the, the size of the, uh, of the vector we operate on there and add it to the address. Check the end, and then uh, the load next and the store current operations for the input iterator. So we say here, okay, we're finished. Load the next one, and the output iterator say, 
for the output iterator, it means, okay, we have finished, store the result we put in now, and we want to use the next buffer now as to, to write our results. Uh, we access, here we access the, the data, we say uh, we dereference uh, with the star operator, and we get a pointer or yeah, an iterator. Um, in our prototype, it was all based on pointers in our, in our prototype. Um, we, we get a pointer to the segment that we can now compute on. And then we just call our uh, algorithm with these pointers, and we're done. Now, those slicers, what are they about? If we have this, uh, if we have a vector like this, and we have, say, four, we use four SPUs. Um, the SPUs could access the, the vector like this. Um, one slice is the size of four, and each SPU ac accesses uh, one slice, um, and they are, uh, they follow each other. Uh, in the next iteration, the SPUs would access uh, this memory, and in the next is straightforward. But you could really invent any way of accessing this memory. You could say, okay, SPU0 accesses this, SPU1 starts here, SPU3 starts wherever, or you can really do whatever you want. Another uh, a slicer we provide in our library um, works like this. It, required, it, it needs to know the size of the entire vector, and the uh, SPUs can access the memory in this way. This, this, can be this can be an advantage if maybe you need to do the computation here, you need the value here, or whatever. Okay, now of course we didn't just uh, write this prototype, um, but we um, created a, a real pop, it, it became a real part of our library. We added uh, a class that's called remote vector to have more expressive code. Um, on the PPU, you would create your uh, SD vector with the data you want to compute on, and then you call the kernel. Calling the kernel, uh, in the, if you do it, if you wrote the kernel in the way I presented before with this very straightforward uh, syntax, an STD vector would be automatically, uh, con would, would on the SPU uh, side automatically be a remote vector. And a remote vector is a shallow uh, structure that only contains an address and a size. And now you could do something like this. You say, uh, here is my iterator. I created again with the same uh, arguments. And then you can do vector begin, uh, assign this to the iterator, and until vector end, and do plus plus and access. And here you could put your computation. So it's the slicer that actually is the only point where where different code is executed on different exactly processes or different data access. Different yes, process. yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and you can write your own slice, and you can you can put there uh, even if you want a, a lambda function or something like that. The user can write its own its own slice. So is all this um, the use of, of this cell processor based on uh, SIMD? Because right now, I mean, all of these uh, processes are executing the same code. Right, all the data is different. Yes, you would. You what you would do is. Is, you would is this do a particular mode of programming it, or is cell designed? No, this is this is a particular mode, mode. of programming. You could have uh, each SPU execute a different application, uh, mm -hmm. a different different function. You could mm -hmm. do that if you wanted to, and I I believe it is done a lot in the games for the PlayStation, uh -huh. where you yeah. assign different tasks to each SPU. Well, for the tree of games, of them that actually use the SPU. I think Make they it are five now, but well, they are used. Well. They use it quite extensively, I think. Um, because if I mean, if you look at the the graphics they have on the PlayStation, yeah. it's quite amazing what they can do with this uh, system. 
So these are the features. Uh, yeah, uh, we have the remote vector. We created write, read, read, write, and read, write iterators. Um, the read, write iterator really makes only sense with a minimum buffer size of three, because in this case you always have one uh, slice in incoming. You compute on another on, on the second slice, and one slice is outgoing. So this this would be. Uh, have you guys looked into this uh, programming language called Chapel? Mm -hmm. it, it, no, it's no, a okay, it, it, it's a it's a it's a language designed for this kind of calculations, but on a cluster okay. of computers. But but they also can use it on on multiple cores or or on GPUs okay. as well. So so a lot of ideas here are so similar to what they are doing. For instance, this partitioning of, of your data space using the slicer, they call it domain. Okay. And they separate the, the slicer separates the way you partition your domain from the actual calculation. Yeah. Right? I guess this idea of a slicer you would have in, in any parallel yeah. uh, library because you need to cut your data up somehow. Mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. to separate the, your, your domain, the problem. And the other thing they use, and, and maybe this, this could also be generalized to that, they use the partition global address space, PGAS, mm -hmm. which means they just map all the address space into one address space that involves you know, local memories of all the processors, or memories of, or of computers in the cluster, and so on. They just have one. So that when you are passing this huge vector here, that would be sort of your global address space. And then when these uh, guys are accessing just parts of it, they are accessing these parts that were mapped onto their oh, local okay. memory. Okay. I don't know, this is kind of abstraction that might work for this problem too. Yeah. That was the, um, there was a version of OpenMP on the cell that tried to do this. Yeah. Except for scrap. But I blame, I blame the implementation, not yeah. the model. Uh -huh. and, uh, it was basically this, you were just looking at everything. I mean, you had your, your 8 times 256 kilobytes as a huge uh, memory block, and you can just copy data from one side to the other side, and everything was done through this. But, well, something was well, but, missing. But in, in Chapel, you know, you have the same, exactly the same problem. You have, you have your memory, and, uh, and then, of course, you have to send it to other clusters in, in MSA. So this is your DMA, yeah. though, right? So it's very similar. I wonder if they have an implementation for this cell. Maybe they don't. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we have, of course, various slicers. Um, and, um, yeah. Um, after we did this, um, we, we worked a lot with image processing algorithms, and we thought, oh well, um, for some algorithms, it's, at, it's an advantage to have not mm, contiguous, to, to access the memory not um, like it was a 1D vector, but like a 2D vector or an image. So next we created a 2D iterator, 2D segmented iterator, I have to say. The advantage here is that it's that we can support 2D transfers natively on this platform, since we can give the memory flow controller a list of DMA accesses we want to it to execute. Uh, so we cr we just create a list. We say, I want to get from this address 20 bytes, from this address 128 bytes, uh, and then the the memory memory flow controller will work through this list asynchronously and do all do the 2D DMA for us. We don't have to do separate DMA uh, accesses. So this worked to our advantage, and we successfully created a 2D uh, segmented iterator. Um, the difference to, a, to the 1D iterator is the following. The slice size is, of course, 2D. It has an X and a, and a, and a Y dimension. Um, we have a remote vector 2D that not only has a size, but uh, a, a, again, uh, X, X and Y dimension. Uh, the slicer takes, of course, then 2D arguments. 
And we, as, we, as I said, we found that this is ideal for image processing. So if you have an image like this, uh, you would uh, want to cut it up in, in smaller images and send it and, and let the, the SPUs work on it. And this works very well with our um, 2D uh, segmented iterators. So you, you could slice this image up like this and uh, transfer this, Im this part of the image to SPU0, this part to SPU1, and so on. And the, S the SPUs can then, do run, can then run their algorithms. So suppose that you wanted to do like Gaussian blur of the image, right? Yes. So you would go through this, the, this rectangle, but at some point you have to, on the boundary, you have to access a pixel that's yeah. neighboring, right? And uh, What you could do is, is you Is it trans transparent or, or do you have to program it? You have, you have, you have an overlap slicer. Right? Exactly. Yeah. You, you had to program that, but you would use an overlap slicer. You would say, okay, SP, uh -huh. oh, sorry. SPU0 accesses mm -hmm. this and a little bit more. Mm -hmm. and so there would be an overlap in the in the in the small patches you, mm -hmm. you uh -huh. work on. And would also take care of the boundary. Okay. Yes, 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 exactly. Uh -huh. But what, what I don't see in that case is when you have processed tile number zero, you overwrote some data yet that you need for tile number one to do the blur. Isn't that right? That's, that's if you blur in place. Yeah. But usually we we have one input image and we start ah, okay, the other one. Thanks, yeah. But yeah. You, you have the same problem whatever. Yeah. Stuff. You, you have to take care of not burying in place because it doesn't make sense. Okay, so these are these are our uh, iterators. Uh, we were very happy about this. Uh, um, we were able to to implement some mm. interesting algorithms on the cell using this because really when you this allows you to to really not think about the memory limitation you have. You just say, okay, I have my data there and I just access it. I, I don't care about that. I don't care that I only have 250 kilobytes of memory in my in my um, for for my SPU. So yeah. I th we think this is a very powerful uh, abstraction. Okay, now this this of course works uh, also between SPUs. If you wanted to that to do that, if you wanted to build a pipeline, since uh, uh, everything is mapped to one uh, unified memory space, you can just access data from anywhere you want. So you can on SPU one you could create an iterator that iterates over data that is in, S in the memory of SPU0 if you want to do that. <coughs> because you, you would have to do some synchronization and other things. And for this, uh, we created the part of the library that gave it its name, and that's the MPI part. So uh, MPI, the, the MPI part of our library allows very high level communication between the SPUs. <coughs> um, a very quick introduction to MPI. I think we we talked about it uh, a lot before, but uh, it's an inter-process communication uh, library that allows uh, uh, processes to communicate by passing messages. So in our implementation, SPUs basically send and receive messages. Um, it's an API specification that is used in high-performance computing very extensively. Um, the features are, these are not all of the features, but the, some of the most important ones are you can you ha can create a virtual topology of your processes. This is a feature that is rather important if you have a lot of processes, but on our platform we only have eight, so, well, not, not very important, you, you don't lose uh, the site of your SPUs. You can do synchronization, I mean, you can do point-to-point -point communication, and one of the mm. most important things for, for us is the collective communications. Um, collective communications, I, I just go through uh, a few of them. Um, let's assume we have four processes, or let's assume we have four SPUs, actually, and 
SP01 has some data. Uh, the broadcast collective would, uh, by through one function call, allow this data to be transmitted to all the other processes. Like this. There are the scatter and gather uh, collectives. Um, in the scatter case, pro SPU one, one SPU has for each of the other pro SPUs <coughs> some data prepared. Like this, A1 to A4, and the scatter operation scatters these uh, this data these data elements to all the other processes or, or SPUs. Like this, um, the gather uh, is kind of inverse. In this case, all the processes have um, data prepared, and only one process wants to have the wants to have all the data, so it calls gather, and actually all of them call gather. And we end up with something like this. Uh, very interesting uh, collective is the reduce uh, function. It's similar to the to the gather, where all processes have prepared some data, and one process wants the data wants to receive the data, um, but it wants to there, there should be an operation performed on the data. So, process, process one will receive something like this. And there's an operation performed on this data, operation performed on the operation with this data, and so on. You, you get the idea. And then there's the all-to-all -all collective. Um, that is basically a matrix uh, transpose uh, operation. Each processor has prepared some data for each other processor. Is there a question? <laughs> no question? <laughs> I'm happy to explain. Okay. Um, so, for the all to all, each process has prepared some data for the other processes. And after the operation, each process will have the data that was prepared by the other process. By the other processes, actually. Um, so we, we implemented the the MPI basic MPI send receive and asynchronous send receive functions for the cell processor, as well as the collectives that build on them. Um, as uh, we took the the Boost MPI uh, implementation in inter in the Boost MPI interface as an example, because it's it's just very powerful and just a lot better than uh, the native MPI stuff. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like uh, on the SPU using our cell MPI implementation? You would create a, communi a communicator, I call the communicator your world, because if you create a communicator without any arguments, it means that part of all SPUs are part of the communicator. Um, the rank uh, of the rank is, is always the ID of, of the SPU. Um, so if world rank equals zero, will only be executed on SPU zero. And if, if the rank is one, of course, SPU one. So what happens here is uh, SPU zero will send hello to SPU one and then receive world from SPU one. And of course, SPU one will receive and then send. Um, the interface is like this. This is the the receiver. So this is the for the remote SPU. When we want to communicate with SPU one. Um, this is the tag. We can tag our messages. Uh, this is of course the message and the size of the message. So you can see here that the the send and the, the matching receive have the same tag as well as in this case. It's very, very simple and straightforward. Um, looking at the communicator interface some more, um, there are send and I send, which are the asynchronous uh, counterparts of send uh, mm -hmm. methods, as well as, uh, oh yeah, there's a barrier, also very important, of course. And we have include and exclude functions that allow us to include elements from an, 
to include an, include include SPUs in a communicator or exclude them. And we can, can of course compare uh, communicators. There are a, a number of there are more uh, function methods here. I just uh, put them most important ones on this slide. Um, if we do asynchronous uh, send and receive, the request uh, class becomes becomes important because an asynchronous send or receive will return the will return a request class that allows us to wait for the request or to test if the request is already finished. And the test will rec return a status class. Uh, status object that contains the source uh, tag and error if one occurred. Now the collective, the collectives, they are free functions. They always take a communicator as an argument to in indicate which SPUs are uh, taking part in the collective operation. And yeah, this is this is an example for the reduce uh, collective, where not only a type uh, is specified, but also an operation that should be uh, performed. The the different interfaces are just uh, this is uh, I think for one element, and here we we have can we can transfer an array of elements. What is root? Um, the root is the ID of the SPU that will receive the result. Okay. Um, now I want to talk about the implementation of our uh, cell MPI. Uh, of course, we have to have some kind of protocol that handles the, the communication. We have some kind of, oops. We create some kind of header um, that contains the communication identifier to that indicates which again which SPUs uh, are or which from which uh, communicator the message was sent. There's of course the message tag, the data type, um, data size, some control flags, and some other magic. Uh, of course, the address. And here, this is some these are some magic fields that I will explain briefly later. Um, now for the protocol, it's it's actually straightforward. Um, <laughs> although it doesn't look like it maybe. <laughs> for some definition it's straightforward. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's really yeah, yeah. it's really easy. Um, what we want to do is we want to be able to send asynchronously. Um, and we, we build all this communication on top of DMA access. There's nothing else. So, what we want? To, what happens when we send uh, data? We pre-process the data. That means we check if the data is aligned to, so we can send it right away. We, and we prepare the header. And then we check: Did we already receive a header from? Because of course, it's it's always two-sided communication. So we always have to have a matching send and a matching receive. And it could be in the case where uh, the sender enters the send function, that the receiver already entered the receive function and sent his header. So if this is the case, um, if the header was already received, we know everything to do the communication. We know the destination address. And really, the, the, the only point of doing MPI on the cell is we, we don't want to communicate, we don't want the user to communicate the destination or the source address. So, if we receive the header, we know where to put our data. We can just, the sender can just put its data um, where it uh, should be. And, of course, the data transfer is started asynchronously, and then the uh, function can return here after it started the transfer. And it will enter again later if we want to. We want to make sure that the transfer is complete. We we re-enter here, and just synchronize, and we're done. If we didn't receive a header, um, we create our header and we send the header over to the receiver. The receiver will do something very similar. Um, 
it will check if, if a header was received. If yes, it will send, it will fetch the data, of course, uh, and return. And uh, if we want to make sure that the transfer is finished, we <coughs> enter back in here. Now there, you, you might wonder why these two are not uh, equal, because normally it should it should be the same, right? Um, but <coughs> in fact, it's it's not like that because um, if we didn't receive a header and we send our header, uh, we return here. We say, okay, we're finished basically because the other the other side can do the communication. We told the other side what to do. So now we re we enter here and we check if we received the header. If we received a header that indicates uh, everything okay, I got the data, I'm finished, we're done. But if we re receive the header um, that says, okay, he put, put the data here, then we know, okay, this we sent our header to tell the receiver to transfer the data, but this receiver at the same time sent a header to, to tell us where to uh, put the data, and we have to again send and we have, we have to send per per uh, uh, definition we have to send the data so if there's a conflicting num there are conflicting headers per definition the sender puts the data this is the way our uh, protocol works so this is all synchronous send and synchronous receive. no they are asynchronous but you block in the send right until the receiver receives it I mean, if nobody is waiting for your data, then you will be blocked forever, won't you? If nobody, yes. If there's not a matching receive, receive. to my send, exactly. but I mean, you have a bug in your. So you, you made a synchronous send this way because a synchronous send waits until the receiver arrives. Yes. It's implemented using yes. asynchronous you, you cannot internally. Finish your, internally. You cannot can, cannot finish. Mm -hmm your send without the receiver doing something, yes. Right. It's two-sided. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Th this is the difference between uh, the MP our MPI part and the iterator part, because the iterators just put data or get data. They don't care if right. there's something right. else on the other side. Mm -hmm. But of course, there's the this of course implies some kind of synchronization, mm -hmm. as you said, yeah, synchronous. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, now types. One of the big advantages of, or yeah, we, you talked about it before, uh, the big advantages of MPI and Boost is serialization. Um, you can send whatever you want, and it works most of the time, and you know, maybe know more about that than I do. Um, we don't do that. We don't do Boost serialization. It's, it's, it's too big an overhead. Yeah, it doesn't fit in the memory. Yeah. <laughs> it's too big an overhead for us, so we are limited in this way. We can only send certain certain types, and of course we can send pod types. Uh, we have, we of course send can send all integral types, uh, and if you want to send your own type, we allow you to register your type with us. We have a macro that says, okay, you know, this type is really pod, and please send it for me. And we, we trust you that it's really pod, and we send it for you. <laughs> or, if you want to send more complicated stuff, uh, we allow you to specialize two global uh, functions. They are called I send and I receive. Now, all the communication that is done in our uh, MPI uh, library goes through these two functions. So you can specialize it, and everything that builds on top will work automatically with it. Um, the registering pod types is a little hack, I have to say. Uh, what we do is um, we, uh, with, with the type you give us, we, we, we create this, this struct, and we take the address of the struct to identify the type. This works only if, of, of course, only if all SPUs execute the same code. If some SPU executes a different code, this will not wor work anymore since the address can be anything. But uh, since our domain programming model for us is to have all SPUs execute the same code, 
this works quite well. Um, yeah, so that's how we register pod types. And here is an example of how you would overload the global, uh, the free I send and I receive function to send um, a vector. Um, the sender will first send the, to the receiver the vector size. The receiver uh, resizes the vector, receives the size, resizes the vector, and then, and, and after that, the sender uh, sends asynchronously the values, and the receiver uh, receives the values as it comes. Rather straightforward. So it's really a mixture now of synchronous and asynchronous, right? Because if the receiver is not there, you block forever. I guess, yeah. right? Yes. But if receiver is there, you just start sending the data and come back. Exactly. Well, for the, for the stuff like sending you back or asynchronously, we, we have to block in the size. Well, we didn't find any algorithm where we can basically send the size and the data asynchronously and let no, the other guys on the yeah. side, yeah, there is stuff in this and try to figure out what's going on. You would have to have some kind of queue or mail box yeah, or yeah, something exactly. like and we, that. And we don't, and yeah. we don't have, this, we don't right, have the space right. for that. We, yeah, exactly, we don't have the space, but of course mm -hmm. you could also just create well, a buffer. We, we could have, well, we could have a tag that says, this is the size and this is the data. And uh, you receive you receive to one of the tag and you sort them afterwards. But the problem is that you don't know what you are going to get as a type, so you don't know where to start from. And stuff like or that. you could go through main memory. Yeah, but it's oh yeah, that's double forward. copying. Oh yeah, there there's an there's actually an implementation implementation of MPI yeah. for the cell that goes through mem main memory, mm -hmm. and you, you it's much memory. much faster. We're like, we're slower. I mean. We're like twenty <laughs> times faster. Yeah, yeah, you lose all the, the cool oh, stuff so you have point, in the yeah. architecture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so sending an STD vector, if you could do it like this if you wanted to. Really, yeah, I, I would advise against it, but some people might want to do that. Now, I, in the beginning I told you, and this is the, the last uh, part, in the beginning I told you that Communication is really restricted because we have to we have to send aligned memory. Okay. Um, our MPI uh, doesn't care about that. You can send any memory. You can allocate it in a way you want, uh, and we we send it for you. The way we do that uh, is illustrated here. So let's assume we have some block of data uh, at the source and some block of data at the destination. And they, both blocks are not neither aligned nor are they a multiple of 16 bytes. So the, uh, the uh, first aligned address is actually here and the last aligned address is actually here on the source and the destination is here and here. So what do we do? We have a small static 32 byte buffer um, on each SPU, actually two on each SPU. Um, and first we will put the stuff that doesn't, that we cannot transfer directly into this buffer. So this would be everything to the first aligned address and everything from the last aligned address into the buffer. Okay. Then we transfer the buffer, the 32 byte buffer, to the destination. The destination has a, has a similar buffer and we transfer the data. And we can also transfer from the first aligned address at the source to the first aligned address at the destination, obviously. Uh, now the data is here. It's the data arrived at the destination, but of course it's in the wrong position. So what we have to do is we have to first in place, do an in place memory copy to move the data to the correct position, and then from the from the buffer, copying the missing parts to the correct locations here. So this way we can do uh, unaligned memory transfer without requiring uh, any significant amount of buffer. We just need two 32 byte, byte buffers. Well, why can't you just send the stuff with uh, padding on both sides? Um, 
like instead of starting from the aligned place, you just start from uh, the previous aligned. Yes, place. we could do that to send, but where would we put that? I mean, it would be bigger than the destination has. But the destination could also allocate more memory. Right? If we, if the destination did that, the destination could also just align. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> see. Right. You can have cases where the guy says, just say, okay, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I have a I vector of my SPU and I want you to put there, which is the uh, 17th uh, element of size 15 inside my vector and live with that. So, mm -hmm. Of course, if, if you have, well, we, we did that with PRT point. If you have the complete control on how your containers and whatever is exactly. working on the cell, mm -hmm. you can just have a containers that just allocate each element with necessary padding, each between, and have the iterators skipping over the padding, and when you transfer, you can just transfer directly into mm -hmm. this. But you need to also control what's going on. Yes. You wanted to ask something? Yeah, uh, did I understand that correctly? That's that in-place move is necessary if the misalignment is different on the sender and receiver side. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's fast because it is at full clock speed. It's not fast. It's, it's not. Fast. It just doesn't need additional memory. Okay. You would. You would need a copy anyway. Yeah. If you put it in a buffer. Okay. But we don't need a buffer. That's that's the whole point. But I thought it, it's in that 256 kilobyte space. Yes. Which operates at full clock speed, doesn't it? Yes. So it should be pretty fast. But it's an it's an overhead. Yeah. No. Yeah. Of course. The, the, the mem memory move is an overhead. And you can see that in if you do a benchmark. It's, okay, it's yeah. a significant overhead. Okay, I see. Because DMA puts that stuff directly there where it needs to be. Yeah, same. Okay. Um, and really, if you follow our ins the instructions we give you with our library, this never happens. Because we tell you how to, we give you tools to allocate memory in, an, in a good way. And, but if you, if you say want to port existing, if you just want to put your existing code there, we can, we can do what you want to do. But you pay the price. You pay the price, you pay a performance a penalty, of course. Exactly. Okay, so to conclude, um, the, I, would, I don't want to say recipe, but a few uh, good su suggestions to if you if you're facing this uh, an architecture like this, I would. Yeah. Joel <laughs> <laughs> just said flee. Um, yeah. No. Take CMake to simplify anything that has to do with building stuff. Um, I would do that certainly. Um, boilerplate code generated or create make it simpler generated with. Uh, with preprocessor or whatever uh, you want to use. Um, the, if you have to do two compiler runs, the ambiguity of functions and markers in different, different compilation units can be an advantage if you know how to use it. Um, so, um, I think in Boost, the solutions are often optimal work very generic and perfect. To fit uh, an architecture like this, they have to be somehow adapted. An example for this would be, we, we don't do serialization in uh, Boost MP, in, in our MPI implementation, because it's just not possible. So we adapt it, we, we try to mimic the optimal way as good as we can, but, well, we have to say at some point, okay, no, it's just not possible. Um, so we have to find a sweet spot between generic, generic code and efficiency, really. Um, and I think as, I, as we showed with the iterator stuff, we can, difficult low-level code can be wrapped very nicely in C++ concepts. And the C++, I think, in my opinion, the iterators are, the way we use it, they are much more powerful than, like, okay, they, they are powerful, but they can do a lot more um, on this architecture. Okay. So much for my presentation. Thank you for your time.